When it comes to your network, visibility is imperative because you can't secure what you can't see. Riverbed's network performance management solution gives you 100% network visibility 100% of the time. Now you can resolve performance issues and security threats up to 90% faster and reduce response time, damage, and cost spent on remediation and containment efforts. Connect with Riverbed today and learn how their NPM solution can protect your network by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Riverbed. Workloads protected by VMware are the safest workloads in the multi-cloud. Private cloud, public cloud, any cloud. Stronger, with distributed protection to the API and everything east-west, inside and cross-cloud. Stronger, with three layers of detection, trusting nothing and seeing everything, even the best hidden bad actors. Stronger, with an SE Labs AAA certified advanced NDR that brings the multi-cloud together for the win. You've got workloads, we've got security. VMware Security. Simply stronger. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash VMware to learn more. The hybrid workforce is here to stay, and it requires real-time visibility, control, and rapid response of every endpoint, whether it's in the office or home. Tanium offers an endpoint management and security platform built for the most demanding IT environments. Many of the world's largest and most sophisticated organizations, including nearly half of the Fortune 100, rely on Tanium to deliver unmatched endpoint visibility and control. Whether you're preparing for zero trust or protecting your network from supply chain risk, Tanium empowers technology leaders to achieve greater agility, efficiency, and confidence. Learn more at securityweekly.com forward slash Tanium. Welcome back to Enterprise Security Weekly. Do you have a specific guest or topic that you want us to cover in one of the shows? Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. I did that twice yesterday. We review suggestions monthly. They say monthly. I think we do it more often than monthly even and we'll reach out to you once reviewed. Also, join us for our next live webcast on December 2nd to see what's under the XDR hood. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to save your seat. And don't forget to check out our library of on-demand webcasts and technical trainings at securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. Now on to the news. Got some good news in here. I don't know if we're going to get to all of it, but um, I am going to let Tyler and uh -oh. Katie start here because I'm I'm sure you all you both already have some favorites in mind. I'm I'm thinking, or if you don't, I I, I, can, <laughs> I can start off. If I'm putting you on the spot, let me know. No, I'm sure we have favorites in mind, but I'd like to hear what Katie's at before I give you mine. All right. Well, uh, I, I've got a couple here. Um, obviously, the 18 cybersecurity bills, proposed cybersecurity bills, uh, that's just mind blowing. Some of them are a lot more interesting to talk about than others. Some of them make sense. Um, others of them are like, what what do you think? What, what do you think is actually going to happen here? Um, so that that's a good one. Uh, that we could perhaps start with. And then, of course, Emetet, as if anybody thought that was gone for real. Yeah. Yeah, how, how about the bills? You know, it's like you're waiting forever for the government to, to step in and do something, and then, boom, 18. <laughs> What's it's going most on? ridiculous. It makes a heck of a lot of sense, right? But some of these, like, we're going to pay all this money for cybersecurity awareness training. It's not awareness training that's the problem. Every company has some sort of awareness training. We need, we need to focus on habits, we need to focus on technology, and we need to start actually doing something about it. Giving people little phishing tests online isn't helping. Even the phishing companies, phishing testing companies have realized that that's not good enough. So why does the government think that that's gonna be good enough? Yeah, it's, this this is absolutely ludicrous and ridiculous. <laughs> the bulk of them, um, well, they've all been introduced, many with bipartisan support, may or may not be passed, and they just stomp all over each other. There's no rhyme or reason to the, you know, the unification, the intelligence of, of them and how they work together to create anything of a secure nature, and they're all just buzzwords. I'm, I mean, I'm just... Yeah. You know, and I, I just love the ones that are like the advisory act of 2021 as if it's some big 
thing to have 18 different versions of of the same garbage i'm just not not i am i am severely underwhelmed these I mean, clearly we, weren't written with the guidance of anybody who knows what they're doing a lot of them there are a few of them that if you dig into them a little bit make a certain amount of sense but at a high level these are people trying to win public appeal not actually yep. solve the cybersecurity problem yeah I guess we could say at least, uh, you know, we've got their attention, you know, but we, we just Maybe. got done talking to, you know, somebody in the insurance industry, you know, who looked like uh, they, they were paying out a lot more than they were expecting to, had a lot more exposure than they expected to. And his conclusion was that they need more technical expertise in the insurance world. So maybe maybe uh, this is cyber insurance a couple of years ago <laughs> and they'll eventually get there where you know, on individual representatives, staffs, you know, will, will actually have uh, somebody with cybersecurity experience. Who knows? But will it actually, I think to Katie's point, will it actually result in any forward momentum or forward progress? Even if you put a bunch of legislation in place without, without teeth and without uh, the ability to bite for those that are inactive or yeah. not following, it never gets anywhere anyways. My favorite one here is uh, the Enhancing Grid Security Through Public-Private Partnerships Act. Wow, novel. <laughs> we need a bill for that? Really? Well, we'll see. At the end of the day, we can just hope that the <laughs> yeah, right mean, ones get passed and the right ones fade away, although I am not optimistic. I mean, DOE already has like a huge um, capture the flag thing that they put. I'm pretty sure it's DOE. And just this huge, huge capture the flag with like thousands of people from different organizations, from private, public side. And they do these these big, um, you know, training exercises, basically. I mean, I mean, they're it's done as a competition, but uh, but really it's it's training for actual events that could occur. Uh, if that's not what's being described from by this bill, I don't know what is. I, I wish I could remember the name of it. Uh, we actually have some people heavily involved uh, that live close to me because uh, Oak Ridge National Labs is just down the road from me. Yeah, a few of these are just baffling. The Secure Equipment Act that says the bill requires the Federal Communications Commission to establish rules stating that it will no longer review or approve any authorization application for equipment on the covered communications equipment or services list. So basically they're trusting that, you know, nothing's changed. How is that helping cybersecurity? Yeah, don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it, I found it was called the uh, Cyber Force Competition. And, and it's a big part of, you know, that they're trying to train people up and, uh, you know, create opportunities and create a workforce of cybersecurity folks. So they've got the competition, the uh, career fair. So like a lot of this stuff, like did they even look at what was already going on before putting these together? Of course not. No, <laughs> absolutely not. No way. Should we move on? Are we wasting our time here? I think we should move on. I think, you know, I'm, I'm sufficiently worked up here. We should move on to something good. Tyler, you pick. You make it a happier conversation. Oh, no, no, no. Well, uh, it won't be any happier that what I'm going to pick is uh, – um, insanity and craziness and lunacy i'm nice gonna work. pick uh you nailed it i'm gonna pick a <laughs> one a 1.3 billion dollar funding round no as uh, adrian said in the opening uh, moments of our show it is not the valuation that's the amount they raised in this round on an 8.5 billion dollar valuation it's just absolutely crazy. Previously having closed a $525 million funding round, the company has now completed five funding rounds in the last six years. Absolute insanity. As a side note, I went back through, I, I am a uh, data hoarder and I keep, um, I have notebooks dating back to uh, 2002 on my bookshelf. And in one of those notebooks, not that far back, I have notes on a chat I had with Laceworks. They had, at the time, this was July 17, 2020, so two and a half years ago, two and a quarter years ago, they had 140 employees and 110 customers. 
they could not have been more than 10 million, 15 million in ARR at most, probably less. So in two and a half years, they have gone from a couple hundred million dollar company, 300, 400 maybe, to eight and a half billion dollar company. It's just astronomical and insane. It's it's pure lunacy. The press release does say that they've repeatedly exceeded every goal over the last 18 months. Well, sure. I set my goal at 5% annual growth. I exceeded it. I quadrupled it. I 100x'd it. Goals are arbitrary. I, I just, I mean, sure. Let's let's say they did three 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 hundred x growth. Let's say they did 3x growth on a 10, 10 million base in 2020. I don't know that's what they had. You know, I don't have that data, but let's just make an assumption. You know, 10 to 30, 30 to 90, 90 to... Uh, two hundred million is that worth an eight and a half billion dollar valuation? I don't know. We gonna find out. Well, it is worth it. Apparently, it doesn't matter if we're gonna find out or not. <laughs> they got it. Right, right. And uh, well, it's worth I, it to I mean, someone. we'll we'll see if there's an exit or an IPO. What what happens? It's and, always the exit that's that becomes the hard part, right? So when you're an eight and a half billion dollar company, where do you go from there? You're an eight and a half billion dollar company still burning. Yeah, I mean, you almost have to go IPO. There, there's just not that many companies that can acquire you at that size. But um, I kind of wish I had put together um, a total of what Palo Alto has spent on acquisitions putting together Prisma. Because I'd be interested to compare it to... You know the, these startups they're competing with, with the Orcas and the and the Wiz. Yeah, um, build versus buy. Who knows? But it's not costing eight and a half billion dollars or whatever. You know, even a one point three billion dollar cash infusion, it's not costing that to build LaceWorks. I, I mean, we're in an era where it's cheaper now to build a business than ever before, and we're getting one billion dollar investment rounds. Like, why do we need that? And, and what's it going to mean, you know, for, for our future, you know, following on our conversation last year, uh, last week, feels like a year, last week <laughs> about what's going to happen with the industry. Is there going to be an eventual crash or a decline? And how is this all impacting? And I mean, it doesn't seem to me, Tyler, you're the investment expert here, but it doesn't seem to me like this there's just no way this can turn out well, even if they have a successful IPO. They have so much money invested in them. I mean, maybe the investors yeah. will get some back, but eight, that's right now. That that's the investment or that's the valuation right now. Eight billion plus. What's it going to be in a year or two? And and you yeah. know who's going to buy them if they can? What is it going to mean for the public? Is there any, have they hit the ceiling? Are they, you know, have they exceeded the ceiling? Is this, you know, a, a Charlie and the Chocolate Factory moment? <laughs> I love that analogy, Katie. That's a really good one. But, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, a 2x for the most recent money in would be an acceptable return on investment for them, you know. Um, and the question is, is there enough revenue plus growth potential to IPO this company at, you know, a 16 to $20 billion valuation? That's the question. And, um, you know, the I think the public comps are showing that it might be. And that's what everybody's placing their extremely overvalued bets into. We definitely so, need a new mystical creature here. We're, we're past unicorns. Absolutely. That That's why I wanted to move it to $8 billion That's one. your cutoff now? We have, we yeah, have eight, our first billion, real unicorn. unicorn. Yeah. Because that, that right, brings well. the numbers back down to, to Earth. On the number yeah, of hey, unicorns that are out there. Hey, Johnny, we need a little unicorn icon every time we talk about the, you know, the rainbow <laughs> unicorns. We need to pop one on the screen going forward. And maybe they should be pooping pots of gold. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there, there's definitely there's room for creativity there. Goose, uh, get on the uh, get on the Photoshop wagon here, buddy. And um, I think this is a good lead in. Like nine is is the logical place to go here. My my story number nine which gives you a nice graph on M&A spending uh, so far this year compared with previous years. And as ridiculous as that 
you know, 49 billion compared to 20 billion last year, as crazy as that is, uh, we're not done with the year yet. You know, that's just Q1 through Q3. And still, I'm not sure you could fit even just the cloud security posture management uh, companies at their current valuations into that. Yeah, I would love a, a, a head count, a, a company count to so you can get a dollar per company average here to wonder, you know, to see what that growth curve looks like. And I'm sure Brendan, you know, the guys over four or five, one pretty intimately. Yeah, Brendan's I'm sure got Brendan, I guarantee I'm sure he's, he's got, got that data, but um, that would be an interesting cut of data to see is just, you know, is this an inflation on count making valuations higher or is this literally double the active count with the same typical price? I'm sure it's a combination of a higher count and a higher price. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's just, you know, we're going to be 3x 2020's M&A spend. It's just absolutely crazy. There's there's no end oh. in sight. Well, the count is so much bigger. I think we've seen as much as 40 acquisitions, cybersecurity acquisitions in a single month. And I remember from my time back at 451, uh, you know, I think the largest we ever saw in a year was like 120. Well, then the question on that, Adrian, is then is the deal size much larger or is there no inflation? We're just seeing the there it is, Goose. I love that. Thank you. Nice. Is there um, is if the deal size isn't too much larger, are we just seeing a roll up consolidation actively occurring here that's contributing to that graph jump? Well, you know, there, there's the. The old endpoint security companies are all getting carved up and divided out. So a lot of this M&A that we're seeing is old value that's already been acquired, IPO, delisted, you know, acquired again by PE, traded around between PE shops, mm. carved up. Uh, so you have to kind of take that into account as well is that there's a bunch of existing value, you know, that's been kind of on the decline, you know, the Symantec's, the McAfee's, uh, stuff like that, or... or you know, climbing again, as as is the case with uh, consumer McAfee, is is worth more than all of McAfee was worth uh, ten years ago when it when it sold to Intel. Uh, apparently, you know, from seven billion to to fourteen billion. Follow so, on um, question. Follow on question for you: Is this a game of hot potato? I get in early and I don't care. I, I don't care what my valuation is because I know there's some other idiot who's going to take the next round, give me the markup, and I can get out of the way. A la Wild yeah. Ventures jumping out on the insane rounds, getting out. Yeah, yeah, and you know I think it makes sense. Um, you know, for the market as as well. You know, we we've definitely got several. I think most of the VCs that are dedicated to cybersecurity investments are early stage. Right. Like they're getting in there, if not finding the company early, building it from from scratch so that they, they know what they're doing. Definitely. Well, um, it's the, in these, it, it's in the later rounds that I, I I don't really know what's going on. I don't the insanity <laughs> for those it. later rounds. I, I didn't even need to look at the lacework article and I knew I would have put money on it. that Tiger Global was in that round. Yeah, and they are just the, they are spewing money. Absolute insanity to get into every deal that they can in the mid and late stages, just because they think they're going to double them quick and flip them out. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. Um, so where do we, where do we go from here? Uh, Katie, what was the other one that you wanted to cover? Emotet. Emotet. Yeah. Or Emotet. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know well, how to say I, I can only comment on the way it was uh, said, I think in the mummy movies, from a long time ago, time ago was Emotet. Ah, okay, so that's Emotet. probably why I say it that. Way. <laughs> I've, I've seen those movies a lot. The the remake with Tom Cruise was garbage. Just putting that out there. I, I don't I, rem I don't that. remember. I don't loved bother. the first Mummy movie, but uh, after that, don't remember. All, all downhill. I agree, Katie. All downhill. So, what's your commentary on Emotet, Katie? Reading this particular article, and maybe it was just this article, or maybe it was because I was reading it early in the morning, um, it seemed to me like the person writing this one article was shocked that Emotet came back, you know, that it emerged after the, quote, big takedown that occurred. And it's, it's not even surprising at all. And I think we have to, uh, as an industry, just... It's a little like COVID. Some of these really, really big campaigns are never going away, ever. And we have to deal with it and we have to prepare for it. 
or else we're going to be caught, you know, just like with ransomware, facing the same problems that we could have figured out, maybe not fixes for, but at least stop gaps for. Because Emotet, it's been around forever. It's going to be around forever. You know, whomever's behind it is, they, they're not going away. We didn't catch them. It's not over. And so reading this article, I was just like, Emotet returns. No, it never went away. It was just laying low for a while. This, you know, this gang, whomever they are, um, they're going to come back with a vengeance. And the, and the author of this one, uh, Caitlin Campano, I, I think is, is probably easily one of the most prolific uh, cybersecurity journalists out there. So it's, I don't know. I, I mean, from the journalist standpoint, yeah, you, you, you want to grab uh, eyes with your with your headlines, but um, but yeah, I totally agree with you, Katie. Like there was too much invested in this for it to not come back, right? Too much invested in it, and you know all of the big splashy headlines about how it had been taken down. You know, if you're a cyber criminal, like you're you're behind the scenes going, yeah, you know, okay, whatever, right? <laughs> and I think the the my favorite line in this was a quote that she included. Um, we used to call this Operation Party Line back when Emotet was dropped by TrickBot in the past. A spokesperson for CryptoLamus, a group of security research who tracked Emotet in the past, told the record. Yeah, Operation Party Line, it's just, it keeps on going and keep going and it's going to mutate and it's going to come back. But at the, you know, at the core, it's still going to be the same old thing. And if we don't figure out how to putting compensating controls, we're going to be dealing with it 20 years from now. Tyler's going to cash out with one of his big investments. He's not going to be paying attention, but the rest of us are going to be paying attention <laughs> 20 years from now. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. I will throw one little uh, fun fact on here. It's uh, Emotep that we were talking about from the mummy is I-M-H-O-T-E-P. So spelled very differently. But the fun mm-hmm. fact is not the spelling. It is the fact that the, the mummy movie that we were talking about is actually a remake of a 1932 version of the mummy starring Boris Karloff. So that's your fun fact of the day. Today I learned. Wow. Hey, we have a new movie to watch. The 1932 version of The Mummy. I can't, it, well, much to what you just said, it just keeps coming back. We can't get rid of it. It's from 1932 <laughs> to 2020 or whenever the latest one with Tom Cruise was, right? Never goes away. Yeah. H- Hollywood is, is uh, so you're drawing uh, comparisons between how Hollywood picks material and uh, cybercrime? I, I apparently am in this particular case. Life it's the gift that keeps on hard, giving. Life imitates life. <laughs> they, they both <laughs> like money. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, so so um, Emotet is um, you know, a common recipe, uh, <laughs> maybe like a malicious M, uh, S-bomb, uh, an M-bomb, maybe we can call it, uh, that you'd see is Emotet would be the, the first piece of malware that uh, would infect somebody's computer from like a, a click and a link in a phishing email or something like that. Um, and then it would drop TrickBot, and then TrickBot would drop Ryuk, uh, in, in the case of the the uh, ransomware crew that used uh, Ryuk. You know, so you, you've got this, um, you know, balance of, of these different malwares. You know, it, it party line's great, too, because they're all designed to work together. TrickBot's very um, modular, you know, has all these uh, uh, modules for pivoting throughout the enterprise and, and uh uh, infecting other systems and delivering, you know, the the actual ransomware that you want to run. So it's uh, Emotet was arguably the most important piece of that triad of malware, right? Because uh, it's the one that gets your foot initially in the door. Sure, sounds like it. And you might have noticed some of these screenshots in that article uh, from the record. Uh, are from a tool that I have linked, uh, I believe it's number 13 in my list here, called Feodo Tracker by abuse.ch. And it, hmm. uh, it's a pretty cool tool that actually tracks some of, these, uh, some of, the, bo- some of the IP addresses that these bots uh, run from. You know, so good source of, of threat intelligence if, uh, if you're looking for something like that. All right. Where do we go to next? Um, So NPM uh, has been just kind of an ongoing dumpster fire. Um, (laughs) 
you know, the way like, you like, said that, the way you said that made me laugh out loud. <laughs> Cause NPM I mean, has literally been a dumpster fire for like ever. Since I joined security weekly, you know, every show I've been on with Paul, just about when, uh, you know, some kind of supply chain threat comes up, we're like, okay, when's, when's NPM going to get popped and, and become a source of malware? You know, when, when is this going to happen? You know, cause we know how tied in NPM is with uh, so many uh, developer workflows, so many uh, uh, CI/CD pipelines, and sure enough, sure enough, it's happened. And not only is uh, are they trying to recover it, you know, we get the article about GitHub's commitment to NPM ecosystem security, uh, which is a which is a good read. Um, I haven't read the whole thing, but uh, obviously, the fact that they're having a put out a blog post like that it tells you how much of a mess that it's turned into but my favorite one is just before that is number seven sorry number six where this guy says i will pay you cash to delete your npm module this is an ep- absolutely epic piece of, he, of writing he, He's referencing LeftPad, which was a case where a guy from Eastern Europe, I, I forget his name, um, had this some kind of disagreement with uh, you know how stuff is managed in NPM, if I recall correctly. Got pissed off, took his toys, and went home. So when he removed LeftPad, there were so many like big mainstream software packages dependent on it. Like it was this mini uh, industry wide emergency. Like all this software that products depended on also depended on this tiny little left pad uh, utility. And uh, <laughs> somebody's just doubled down on that and said, you know what? Left pad needs to happen more often. Uh, based on how popular your NPM package is, I will pay you money to remove it from uh, NPM. Yeah, the best part about this is like the money, sure, whatever. Like, he gives an example of is array, uh, four lines of code, 51 million downloads in a week. So you'll get $710 to nuke it. But the best part about it is the condition of this is you must delete it without notice so that everyone who depends on it wakes up to a broken build. So basically together, we're going to screw over the world and pay you to do it. That just makes me laugh. Well, and I mean, it, it's it's a very anarchistic approach to fixing a problem. Uh, and, and he's not wrong in that if people take him up on that, uh, you, solutions will be found. <laughs> people will either stop using NPM or, uh, you know, they'll, they'll find a, some kind of workaround. I don't know. So, you know, so real quickly, it just, it just, ransomware just, conversation, will they just delete it and then reinstall? Well, I mean, that, that made me think just as you were saying that if that is four lines of code, why do you need a module? Exactly. And I think that's I part totally of what I don't get that. Yeah, that's exactly that's what part, he's trying that's to part say. Part of the trend he, he's upset about here is, is look, we're, we're in this culture where I, I remember seeing some stats, you know, that like some software projects, it's like less than 10% of the code is new. The rest all just comes in via packages. And um, yeah, that that's a huge risk, you know, not just cybersecurity risk, but uh you know, just just a, like a tech debt uh, risk, right? Yeah, it says down at the bottom. I may also ask you to wait to delete your module so that the chaos from each deletion is separated by a few weeks to maximize impact. <laughs> <laughs> he just wants this to go on and on he, and on. He is straight up Tyler Durden of of code yeah. review right here. <laughs> that's that's a good comparison. Um, this was two days ago. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see what happens with that, but, um, we need to monitor, monitor, see if it gets any takers, man. Talk about it next week. If you're yeah. listening and you're considering this, definitely let Adrian know. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. wait a minute. Did you actually click apply? Oh, I just clicked apply and it takes you to the rest of the page that says, okay, the gig is up. This is satire. I'm not actually going to pay you to delete your module, nor do I want oh, to bring about man. a dark winter of chaos. <laughs> Plus it wouldn't actually work. We just got taken. Oh man. We get, we've been owned. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, uh, Hey, Johnny and goose. I think you get, you definitely gotta, gotta put oh, the title. Great. 
we got owned. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. But I still think he's right though. Even even though it's completely meant as satire, I honestly it's like you're using a four a four line library with fifty something million downloads. Just write the damn code. Yeah, it it's um yeah, the point is made. The point is made though. Um right. But it, it, and regardless of whether he's going to do this, you know, I think the like we we just saw it was uh, UA Parser JS that was uh, installing malware on systems. Malware, yes, it was just uh, mining uh, Monero, but still, you know, it's it's not that was not a an outcome that your uh, uh, UAT testing was anticipating. <laughs> your regression no, testing, his, yeah, his, not his right. His write up here in this section is actually quite good. Um, he's basically bringing home the point that that we're making and making the jokes that we we were making when we got taken here. His point is exactly the same, right? Like no no developers do not have any idea whatsoever what's in their dependency tree. They accept anything. They're catching transitive risk from other dependencies that those dependencies rely on that those dependencies rely on and there's no way for you to have a, any kind of understanding of what your application does when you're pulling in that much transitive risk yeah i mean there, there's whole categories uh you know sca you know just for trying to track that whole mess that you're creating right no, it's, it's an entire product line. There's there's companies making hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue solving that problem, right? And uh, yeah, so be smart about it. But I really wish he would have done it. That would have been epic. <laughs> I It would be interesting to have somebody on. This would be more of an application security weekly thing, but uh, I'd love to hear directly from some developers, you know, especially some you know uh, front-end folks that use a lot of Java frameworks and stuff like that. Uh, or JavaScript frameworks um, and NPM libraries. I'd love to hear their take on this. How they I'd like to it. see. I'd like to see some big crypto whale back this. Literally back the original version of this and do it. Yeah. All right. What next? Um, so a few fundings. I'm just going to mention uh, probably the biggest one. Uh, my story number one: Netography. You know, the reason it's a big deal is is because of the uh, the VCs and the the amount. It's a pretty big Series A. It's a 45 million dollar Series A. And uh, Martin Roche is uh, who is the CEO and founder of Sourcefire. Who you know it it got bought by. Uh, Cisco back in 2013 for 2.7 billion dollars. He is the CEO now of Netography. Even, even more interesting for Marty was his technical depth as the original author of Snort. Right, right. So that makes it a big deal. You know, the names attached to this make it a big deal. Looking at what they have for a product so far, I I can't find a big deal anywhere. Uh, the <laughs> only if they say they're the first uh, NDR SaaS. But, you know, somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but they look a very similar to ProtectWise, which got acquired by Verizon. Uh, and the only difference I'm seeing is ProtectWise would consume full PCAPs from your network gear. And this product, product Netography, is, uh, is saying all they need is NetFlow. They don't need deep packet inspection or full packets uh, for detecting threats anymore. Yeah. Not sure that I really have much color to add on this one. I'm not. I'm definitely not the best in this subset of cyber uh, of cybersecurity markets. But um, I'm, you know, maybe maybe it's the fresh new stuff around some of the the cloud provider stuff that where the value really comes into play here that hasn't necessarily been done before. I don't know. I definitely am not a pro in this spot. Well. Again, it'd be interesting to see you know, what they look like when they raise their three hundred million dollar Series B uh, two months from now. Yeah, they'll they'll have seven hundred thousand in revenue and six six customers, so <laughs> they'll be all right. They'll they'll make it work. Oh, um, a new is so one trend I've seen is a lot of data security startups. It's almost like return to DLP here, Katie. I, I don't oh, know gosh. if you've seen a ton of these also, but I keep seeing data security startups. Yeah, it's really interesting because 
you know, to, to borrow what Tyler just said, a fresh take on data security, but I'm not sure it's entirely a fresh take. And we'll, we'll have to see because there is sort of a legacy injury here in the cybersecurity space around data protection and what it means and how complicated it is in terms of actually making it work. And we've definitely seen some new solutions, but I don't think we've really we've hit on the right thing yet. And, you know, this this particular one here, I think it's uh, Laminar. Laminar. Uh, I don't know if that's how they say it. Apologies if, if I'm butchering the name. Um, there's not enough information on their website, obviously, to see what it is. I haven't seen a demo. If, if it works, great. But, you know, there's there's a little bit of history here in the data protection space where it's well, I'll have to wait and see because, you know, everything that's come before it hasn't worked in the way it's been promised. I, I love legacy injury <laughs> or, or you could say deep, deep regrets, right? Yes, I've got a lot of scar tissue with my data security. Yeah, and it's it's something that has to show up because it's, you know, back when I was an industry analyst, I, I predicted that data security would be you know, the the last challenge standing just because it is so hard to solve. Uh, any Anytime you try and put controls around data or track data or label data, um, you tend to insert friction and, and oftentimes way too much friction uh, for, for people to, uh, to live with. And, um, you know, like I, I remember vendors, I'm trying to remember the one that uh, BlackBerry bought, um, but they didn't encrypt the data in such a way that you could revoke access to the data after you shared it with a third party. But of course the catch is you get to download uh, their software um, and then you need credentials for that software. And it was all using PKI, PKI under the covers. So, you know, basically PGP, but um, you know, it was just such a pain to use. You know, I, th I think it's something that ends up like a lot of security tools that we've seen in the past that, you know, with too high friction, uh, still, they they have their uses, but it they tend to be niche uses, like when security is really really super important, you know. But uh, but how how do we roll out that for the whole organization? How do developers, um, you know, how how do we shoehorn data security into their workflows? Yeah, how how do you how do you make that work? With you know, when, when developers are working with data, they need to be working with the data in the clear, right? Um, so that's one issue. Um, there's a new crop of uh, self-protecting data vendors or, you know, so-called self-protecting data vendors who, who get into this, you know, area of the, you know, one line of code can follow your data and can protect it and revoke access. Well, like you said, there's so much friction with that and data changes so frequently and its use cases change from person to person, from department to department. So there's no way to go in and label it as one thing. You can't just say this data is this, we need to protect it in this way because it means different things in different contexts. And, you know, I certainly hope there is some company who has a, a good solution because data is the, you know, the crown jewel, so to speak, of an organization. But I'm in a wait and see mode with, with this particular startup and, and with other data protection companies just because there's been so much hope, so much promise, but nothing has, you know, the, the best we can do at this point is encryption where it works and access controls and behavioral monitoring. Um, and of course, none of that's perfect or else, you know, we wouldn't have had to have our last guest on and be talking about cyber insurance. Yeah. All right, let's uh, start wrapping things up here. There's a few things here we're going to have to skip. Um, I don't have much to say about Snap Attack um, uh, being spun out of Booz Allen, except Snap Attack is it, it's a fun name. I like I like the name. It's <laughs> it is. it's better than 99% of the other security names that I see. Yes, the only one I've heard better recently is Emotep because it matches a great movie. <laughs> It yeah, mentions then, uh, one of a number of 
uh, or one in a series of movie, one great movie in a series of movies, some of which were not so great. Exactly. I love the way you summarize that, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Took me three times, but <laughs> we got there. We got there. So last week I forgot a squirrel story and you guys did not have a chance to check it out uh, before we went over it. So I, I moved it to this week because it, it wasn't officially um, listed in the show notes last week. So now we have the mysterious case of the effing good pizza. Um, and I'll <laughs> let you guys, I'll let you guys, this, this is the ghost kitchens one for those of you that yes. listened to last week. Uh, we covered a little bit about how restaurants are sometimes representing themselves as a dozen or more different restaurants, just using the same ingredients to, you know, serve food different ways as different, different uh, brands. So I, I thought this this was a uh, is an interesting one. I, I don't know if there's any lesson to be learned here from cyber, but it's our squirrel story. What do you guys think? Uh, I'm really not sure how to approach this. Maybe I need to have a, a ghost Tyler brand and have like 20 different versions of me out there. I don't know. That's like that guy. You remember that guy who was hiring people to do his jobs and he had like six different jobs. Oh, I and do remember that. There were there were webcams pointed at his hard uh, RSA tokens, so they they could see the uh, the six digit tokens and log in I, as him. I do remember that. Yep, yep. That that's crazy. No, I'm. Uh, yeah, if I could do something similar and get away with it, I probably would. Isn't that calling advising? Like being an advisor. <laughs> like, Shh! Don't give away all my secrets. Is? Don't give away all my <laughs> secrets. <laughs> Katie, do you have anything to, to add on this one? Not really. More than last week, I read the whole article, okay. and it was long. It was actually a very long article. Somebody spent a lot of time researching this, and, uh, you know, some people could consider what's going on behind the scenes, the whole Uber Eats um, part of it a little sketchy, but, you know, if, if companies are struggling to find ways, uh, restaurants are struggling to find ways to reinvent themselves in an era when on-site attendance at restaurants is down, it, you know, all the more power to them. I read an article about how um, AMC theaters are now going to start selling their popcorn outside of the theaters at little pop-up stores because people aren't mm -hmm. going to theaters anymore. I think it's fantastic. Great. I love movie theater popcorn. I hated going to movie theaters before the pandemic. They were kind of dirty <laughs> and yucky. So, like, I'm super excited about this reinvention. So, if this is what restaurants need to do to stay in business, all for it. I mean, it it apparently works. It's hard not to call it innovation. You know, it does seem very innovative. And uh, yeah, I heard AMC is taking uh, cryptocurrency now as well. Oh my god, I can pay cryptocurrency for my popcorn. Yes, yes, you can. Nice. Awesome. As you stand there it. awkwardly trying to figure out how to how to use your wallet app on your phone and people are waiting <laughs> to get what a, would happen a, to be a seven dollar anyway. small bucket of popcorn <laughs> so it's so a seven dollar qr code it's a seven dollar small bucket of popcorn today it's a seven thousand small book and a small bucket of popcorn tomorrow morning if you right. call it cyber popcorn it's then seven billion dollars and maybe somebody will make an nft of it you'll be all right <laughs> And that is a perfect place to end uh, today's episode. Thanks so much, Tyler and Katie, for joining me today. And a big thanks to everyone watching or listening to this week's episode of Enterprise Security Weekly.